Hello and welcome everyone uh, to today's video covering IoT connectivity. My name is Stefan Sorrell. I am co-founder of Kaleido Intelligence and lead research analyst for the IoT connectivity portfolio. Today I'm delighted uh, to be joined by uh, Luigi Capobianco uh, from Flowlive. Uh, Luigi, why don't you say hello quickly and introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, Stefan. Thanks for hosting us today, hosting me today. Uh, so as you said, I'm Luigi Capobianco. I'm uh, head of Europe and Middle East uh, at Flow Lives. I've been here for uh, three and a half years, and I have a previous history in MNOs and MBNOs, always focused on IoT connectivity. Fantastic. Well, it's great to have you uh, on today's video. Of course, um, we're covering a survey report that uh, Kaleido uh, produced in collaboration uh, with, with Flowlive, really diving deep into uh, IoT connectivity. Over 200 um, MNOs and connectivity service providers uh, interviewed within this survey. But I mean, when you look at those survey results, what was the least surprising thing that you, you saw from, from the market there? So, in my opinion, I think what surprises me the least is the fact that the vast majority, I think it was about 98% of the respondents, of the providers that were interviewed, confirmed or said that, in their opinion, roaming alone is not the right fit for IoT. Uh, and, and only a minority, a small minority, said that actually roaming seems or, or, or global seems, as they were called, uh, are a real solution. Honestly, I think that makes sense. And it may be, in my opinion, that it makes sense today uh, because things have changed and devices have changed and applications have changed. I always keep in mind 2018, 2019, it feels ages ago in the IoT world, but it's not that long ago. Um, I remember clearly POS devices, which were still mainly GPRS 2G devices. We had, when I was at Vodafone IoT, we had customers with a lot of POS devices consuming two to five megabytes a month. That was it, right? That was the consumption. Today, the average POS device is a full Android smartphone with a roll of paper in it, right? And then an and a, and NFC antenna. And it consumes hundreds of megabytes a month. And these applications, they do have minimum latency filtering. If the latency is too high, the application doesn't work properly or in some cases it doesn't really work. So today and, and going forward even more, roaming becomes or became not the right solution for IoT because IoT evolved, became more demanding, more complex. You know, and this will keep going forward. On top of this, is if you add the fact that geopolitical situations have shifted and therefore permanent roaming bands are common, they are becoming more and more common, and that the let's say the the, the 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 world is a different place today than it was five six years ago. We all need to adapt to these two, and unfortunately, global roaming seems probably are not the answer anymore, as we can see from the survey. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, if if a total reliance on on roaming isn't the answer for today's IoT connectivity requirements, what is? What should the what should IoT service providers be doing instead? So one thing that for sure, I think we all understood by now uh, is that there is no one size fits all in IoT, right? Uh, probably many other solutions. So it really depends on the use case. There are, there are use cases um, that may still be able to use roaming sims, global sims, or the, the, the 901 kind of IMSIs. It could be a container tracking device, right? But even there, it's nice to see, and it's interesting to see that even there, the need for satellite non-terrestrial network is growing, right? And in some cases, you cannot have satellite non-terrestrial just as roaming. Now the things, new things are coming up, new, 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 new regulations also are coming up. So I think depending on the use case, in my opinion, to have an efficient, homogeneous, globally homogeneous kind of performance, which allows providers to meet the demands of the growing IoT use cases. In my opinion, a combination of 
multi-IMC with global distributed network, so with multiple local breakouts, is probably the best match mm -hmm. with, with, the, with, with the demands. It allows devices to behave, again, homogeneously around the world. Performances are homogeneous. It allows users to use the same SKU, the same component globally, even in, per in countries with permanent roaming bans. It allows to, therefore, also avoid regulatory restrictions. And big use cases like automotive, governmental projects, healthcare, payment systems, and all very similar needs that we see are getting answered by this combination of, again, multi-MC and global distributed networks with multiple breakout points. Yeah, uh, those are great points. I mean, you know, previous surveys we've done, 1,000 enterprises and, and OEMs specific to IoT, I mean, 78% of that audience uh, who mm. adopted cellular IoT um, actually said, you know, things like local or regional breakout are, are either uh, high or highest importance to their, their IoT strategy. So it's really yeah. no longer optional for providers, right? But, you know, that's the yeah. day. What about, what about moving forward? We all know about the SGP32. No, it's it's uh, it, there's a hype uh, about a positive hype about it. Um, it may, it hopefully will simplify a lot the connectivity scenario, right? Meaning that it it will give users enterprises the it will give them more power, more freedom, right? I think that a combination between SGP32 in the shape of iSIM or, or standard SIMs, no, but, but in any form factor, but SGP32 combined with connectivity management platform aggregators, meaning of course, once, you, once you're using SGP32 and ideally, ideally, yeah, we're talking theoretically, you're jumping from provider to provider depending on where you are, where your devices are. You need one thing which is very important, you need everything to be under the same umbrella. It, it would be a nightmare because we saw it already in the market and it didn't work very well. It would be a nightmare to start jumping from a billing system to another, from a rate plan to another, as soon as your device moves to another profile. So in my opinion, if we combine what I said before, multi-MC, distributed networks, on top of this, we add another layer of freedom, let's say, which is SGP32, then we need to have aggregation. We need to have a platform that allows you to control everything from a single pane of glass, allows you to connect your uh, Vodafone and Orange business and AT&T profiles together with the Flowline Multi-MC solution, all in the same place. These aggregators need to be connected to these platforms, of course. The power of the third-party platforms of the GDSP and the Cisco Control Center will be leveraged into the single aggregation service. But it's important, and we see it with very large rollouts of smart meters, for example. Many of them are have been looking a lot into how do I use a single platform with one login to control everything. So in my opinion, SGP32 will bring this even forward, that the need for aggregators becomes important. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we saw the same in, in, in the survey, right? So, you know, looking, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned yeah. freedom, freedom in the context of uh, SGP32. I mean, nearly 80% of our, our survey audience said that the new specification is far more flexible than the old yeah. one, um, stands to reason. And then, of course, you know, when we talk about, uh, you know, single pane of glass, CMP aggregation, those kinds of concepts, actually 87% uh, of the survey called it important with almost 60% saying crucial. Um, yeah, so some great points there. I believe that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so indeed, Stefan, I believe that. I, I think it's important. I mean, I, I acknowledge it's important. We see it every day for customers to have freedom, but also to have centralized control. And again, it's not that we need to have one thing replacing the other. I don't think that's the case. We've seen it before with other USCC standards also. They didn't fully replace the previous solutions, but it's an evolution, right? It's a complementary thing that needs to fit in the journey of connectivity evolution, which went from, I buy a USCC SIM card and I need to live with it forever, to 
I can move around, I can be flexible, I can uh, respond to the demand of my devices in a more proactive way. So I think if we follow this evolution, again, putting in it um, SGP32, multi-MC, distributed global networks that give you homogeneous performance, then we start seeing a truly scalable and feeder-ready solution for global rollouts. Mm -hmm. Okay, good stuff. I mean, okay, so Luigi, I mean, if you had to give one recommendation to connectivity vendors, um, you know, based on this survey, what would it be? You, you need to be flexible. Flexibility okay. is key in this market. Uh, flexibility is key because regulations change, the market changes, because it's um, it happened in the past and it happens almost every year that a new provider comes in just with a new pricing model and squanders what you've been building so far. So my first suggestion would be embrace flexibility because eventually that's what this market needs. Mm -hmm. We need to do whatever we can and at Flowlight we really strive to do it to remove uh, dependency and complexity from providing connectivity to IoT users. And at the same time, we all need to try and simplify the customer experience of the end customer. Let me call it the user experience in the end. We need to try to simplify the user experience. So try to, try to again, remove complexity, stay flexible, and at the same time, you must stay compliant and you must give your customers a future-ready solution. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so, Luigi, thank you so much uh, for, thank you. for joining me today and sharing your, your insights. And for those uh, uh, watching today's video, I mean, if you wanted to uh, dive deeper into the findings uh, that we've discussed today, you can check out the full survey report. There should be a link uh, on the bottom of this video. Otherwise, it's also available on FlowLive's resource page. Just go to flowlive.net right. slash resources, and you'll find the report there. Um, with that, Perfect. thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks, everyone.